Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today. I'm Leah Hines, Executive Director of the Charleston Library Conference, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the Charleston Conference SSP Joint Webinar, New Models of Scholarly Communication, Libraries Shaping Publishing in the New Era. I'm joined today by Jason Point, moderator for today's session and a wonderful panel of presenters. Uh, Jason is going to get to the introductions shortly. But first, I have just a few um, technical points to cover with our audience. Uh, the webinar is in listen-only mode, so uh, you, we won't be able to hear you speak, obviously. But there is a live chat that's provided. So um, if you have any questions about technical issues or um, audio, you can, you can give me a shout out over there, and I'll be monitoring that attendee chat. Um, for the Q&A for the presenters today, we're going to hold questions to the end for the whole group. So if we would like it if you could use the question mark icon to send um, presenters a question. And Jason will be moderating that Q&A at the end. Uh, we have a, a large group of people attending today's webinar, which is great. But it also means that we may not be able to cover all the questions at the end, but we're going to get to everything that we can. Um, so please do, as you have questions, as things pop up into your head as the presenters are talking, shoot a question over using that uh, question mark icon, the button there to ask the presenter a question. We'll store all those up for the end. Uh, if you're using computer audio and you're having some issues, you might try switching to telephone audio by pressing the phone icon, um, or you can just ask me a question through the chat and I'll try to help as best I can. Uh, as a reminder, the webcast is going to be recorded and the slides and audio, video, everything will be made available afterwards on the Charleston Conference website. So if you have to leave early for whatever reason, uh, we got you covered. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Jason as moderator, and I thank all of you for being here today. Thanks, Jason. Jason, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. There you are. Yay, <laughs> thanks. Hi, I'm Jason Point, Publishing Director at the International Anesthesia Research Society and Education Committee Volunteer for the Society for Scholarly Publishing. SSP's mission is to advance scholarly publishing and communication and the professional development of its members through education, collaboration, and networking. We view libraries as playing a critical role in this ecosystem, and we're very excited to be collaborating with the Charleston Conference on our first joint webinar. Through their interactions with researchers and consumers, librarians are shaping and driving change in publishing and scholarly communication. Like pebbles in a pond, their actions create ripples far beyond their individual institutions. In this webinar, a panel of speakers will highlight ways in which libraries are increasingly taking the lead in the production, curation, discovery, and aggregation of content and its dissemination. Our opening speaker, Sarah Lippincott, will give an, an, over, an overview of the latest news and trends surrounding libraries as publishers and facilitators of research dissemination in the open era, including successes achieved and challenges faced by librarians in these roles. Sarah is a librarian with a focus on open access, scholarly communication, and digital repositories. She was the founding program manager of the Library Publishing Coalition and has also held roles in the libraries at UMass Amherst and Harvard University. Sarah is currently a senior consultant at Born Digital, a web development firm specializing in developing open source digital repositories for the cultural heritage sector. She's also author of Library as Publisher, New Models of Scholarly Communication for a New Era. Next, Maria Bond will discuss new developments in the Open Educational Resource, or OER, landscape, and how such freely accessible, openly licensed text, media, and other digital assets can help address the problems of affordability for course materials for students. Maria is director of the MSLIS program at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and an associate professor in their School of Information Sciences, where she teaches courses on academic librarianship and the role of libraries in scholarly communication and publishing. Maria has also served as the associate university librarian for publishing at the University of Michigan Library and is an associate an assistant professor of English at institutions both in the US and abroad. Finally, John Walensky from London will present new and sustainable open access publishing models for OA cooperatives, as well as success stories from journals that have transitioned to alternative publishing models. John is currently Coastla Family Professor of Education at Stanford University and director of the Public Knowledge Project, which aims to improve the scholarly quality of and access to research and scholarship. 
is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a scholarly author. His most recent book, The Intellectual Properties of Learning, A Prehistory from St. Jerome to John Locke. I trust that you will enjoy and learn from this distinguished trio. And now, here is Sarah. Thank you, Jason, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm really pleased to talk to you all about library publishing. I think this is a phenomenon that many of you are probably already very familiar with. Um, it, library publishing has been a growing trend among content curating organizations, which libraries have been throughout their histories, uh, taking on the role of a content creating organization. Um, and a lot has been written about library publishing's long history, a history that goes back to at least the 17th, 17th century and has persisted well uh, through the 20th century and today. Um, but the rise of digital publishing, which has removed many of the barriers of content production and, and dissemination has really expanded interest in this field. There are now hundreds of libraries around the world with active publishing programs. Uh, pre focusing primarily on open access publication. Um, and I'm not going to, in this talk, retread the kind of the, the steps of, of many of the articles and books um, that have been written on library publishing's origins, its premises, the, the models and workflows and sustainable business models that underlie library publishing. If you're interested in, in more information about those topics, I highly recommend exploring librarypublishing.org, the website of the Library Publishing Coalition for a wealth of resources for and by, uh, for and about library publishers, including a bibliography of relevant literature, um, uh, a job board and a, a whole host of other uh, types of, of information um, and the proceedings of the annual library publishing forum. Um, in this talk instead, I'm gonna focus on connecting library publishing to the grow and growing recognition that the future of publishing infrastructure, content and services is networked and modular. So to give some context to my comments about the, the nuts and bolts of library publishing, I think it's important to reinforce the fundamental values of the library publishing community. Library publishers, first and foremost, often describe their programs as mission-driven. This isn't uh, a, you know, a qualifier that's unique to library publishers. University presses and, and other, uh, especially nonprofit publishers, also use this terminology. Um, but it has a particular connotation, I think, for libraries. It alludes to the fact that libraries typically operate entirely independent of uh, profit or um, uh, of a profit motivation and instead define the services and the outputs of their publishing programs uh, based on their position in their institutions as educators and knowledge creators. Their publishing the library publishing programs tend to be scholar led, that is defined by the needs and interests of the scholars in their communities, and um, uh, as well as actually governed by scholars. Many libra library publishing programs have editorial boards drawn from the schol scholars within their institutions. Um, obviously, many of their publications also are, are led by scholars, uh, both in terms of the editorial content and in the policies uh, and um, and infrastructure that underlie the publications. Um, and it, it this also this idea of scholar led also underscores it in library publishing programs that um, scholars and faculty members and librarians are typically the ones and more faculty members than librarians are the ones providing the editorial guidance for the press in collaboration with librarians providing some strategic direction for the organization. Um, Finally, uh, libraries, library publishing programs are really predicated on openness. Most focus primarily or exclusively on publishing open access content, and more are increasingly pushing for a broader adoption of open source software as the standard um, for library publishing programs uh, and uh, more broadly in the library uh, software ecosystem. Um, and specifically open source software that's governed by an engaged user community. So 
So many publishers, including libraries, have long relied on an ecosystem of proprietary software to produce and distribute their content. Um, B Press's Digital Commons software continues to be the most popular library publishing platform, despite the company's recent acquisition by Elsevier, which left many library customers wary. Um, and libraries rely on a, a host of other proprietary softwares in the um, production and dissemination of their scholarship. But there's a growing movement in libraries and in the, the cultural heritage sector to move away from this model to an open, collaborative, and strategic approach to digital infrastructure. And this is incidentally not a phenomenon limited to library publishing activities, but a broader conversation happening in libraries about all of the pieces of their digital infrastructure, from their discovery systems to their e-learning platforms and analytics software, uh, everything throughout the, the um, landscape of software that libraries rely on to fulfill their missions. So for libraries, I think this is a question of both necessity and of, of living their values or manifesting their values. Um, library publishers, in terms of necessity, library publishers operate at a small scale, typically. They're often, often publishing um, small portfolios of journals, niche publications that uh, don't expect wide readership necessarily, as well as experimental content. Uh, content types that are outside that fall outside of the interests of much commercial publishing or other types of commercial software, um, and haven't been served well that well for uh, by the commercial software um, options uh, for many of their activities. Um, as Kristen Rattan of the Coco Foundation wrote in a recent article, slow, expensive, incomplete, static, and closed. Most of us in publishing are familiar with the problems our community faces surrounding research communication. So libraries are, there. there's, a, I think, a growing recognition uh, among libraries and among those who work with libraries that there's a, a real market for publishing platforms and tools that are the opposite of this, um, that are flexible, open, modular, sensitive to scale, um, and that are independent and accountable to their community. Um, and this is where the, the kind of values of library publishers and the value of the infrastructure intersect. Library publishers want software that works for their purposes, that's fit for purpose, helps them accomplish their goals, but does so without locking open content behind proprietary discovery systems or other, other layers of locked infrastructure. Um, without compromising user privacy or profiting from user data. They want software that centers researchers and, uh, quote, facilitates the use of knowledge and understanding for as wide a range of participants as possible with as wide a range of purposes as possible. That quote is from a report commissioned by the European Union recently on the future of scholarly communication. So again, this, these trends go well beyond libraries into what is the future of, of scholarly communications as a field. Um, and just to kind of emphasize this, as, as content, as we kind of blur lines between content and platform, open access content is, is clearly not, a, not going to be enough um, to enable this broad use and reuse of content globally. Um, as uh, Jeffrey Builder, Jennifer Lynn, and Cameron Nalen warned in a recent article, everything we have gained by opening content and data will be under threat if we allow the enclosure of scholarly infrastructures. So what has uh, has kind of uh, started to occur in this ecosystem has been a proliferation of open infrastructure projects over the past five years um, and, and longer. Some of these are, are older projects than that, um, that aim to address some of these concerns. Libraries are involved in many of these projects, either as leaders or, or lead partners in the development of the software or as early adopters or primary customers of this software. Um, so these, these types of projects address a range of publishing needs from open monograph publishing, digital first open monograph publishing like um, Editoria and Fulcrum, um, to new open source IR options like Tinned. Uh, all of the softwares named here are open source, and many have community government models that explicitly seek the input of their stakeholders about develop, future development uh, policies, et cetera. Um, 
And um, I want to specifically note, too, that these projects aren't exclusively taking place in North America. There's global interest in open source infrastructure. Projects like Amelica in South America um, are working uh, on the same issues. Um, so at first glance, this looks like a lot of new projects, um, you know, it, a lot of projects crammed into one fairly niche space potentially, or a small space of, of this community of mission-driven publishers and library publishers. But I think several, um, I think a lot, a lot of libraries are seeing this as a vision of a new modular ecosystem for open publishing that all of these platforms, all of these types of projects can potentially work together, that they can be uh, compatible or um, complementary to one another. And that um, as, as several uh, library publishers and others in this space have observed, difference and diversity is good, dominance is not. This is from Sherry Barnes at the UCSB libraries. We don't want to create a model where a certain type of approach dominates the others. It would limit possibilities for the diversity of users. Um, again, Kristen Rattan uh, wrote, we need an ecosystem of tools and software creating modular and interoperable systems by the communities that they serve. Um, and from that same uh, EU report that I referenced previously, uh, you know, their conclusion is that in an ideal state, infrastructure would remain totally open and services would remain widely distributed so that no single organization could achieve undue dominance over the communication system on which researchers rely. Um, so, you know, all of this, the effort and um, the, all of these projects are not a, a, dupli a duplication of effort necessarily, but a, um, contributions to a new abundant ecosystem of, of uh, options for digital publishers that they can, uh, they can openly use, adapt, modify for their purposes. So why does infrastructure need to be modular and networked? Um, I, and I think the answer to that is because publishers increasingly see or recognize content as modular and networked. Libraries in particular have long been working with content that defies traditional classification um, and that is not necessarily, it, that does not necessarily adhere to traditional or more linear publishing workflows of, of kind of content creation, distribution, archiving. Uh, it may not be, the content libraries are working with may not be um, disseminated via the same channels or consumed in the same ways as a traditional monograph or journal article. Um, it, uh, you know, it may not be consumed in, it may not be, uh, consumed in the same way as either, uh, instead of simply reading, uh, reading and citing, uh, content, uh, scholars are increasingly, uh, libraries are increasingly working with digital humanists, computer scientists, and other types of scholars to create and analyze content in novel ways, um, from creating nonlinear digital narratives, uh, to facilitating text mining and other forms of analysis that treat large corpuses of content as a data source, this idea of collections as data. Um, and libraries have been eager for, for some time for infrastructure that accommodates this expansive quote unquote view of publishing. Libraries have been working with networked information for decades in their work as knowledge curators, and they're bringing that experience and perspective to bear in their publishing endeavors. Um, An expansive digital publishing was the theme of a recent report from the Duke University Library Libraries, which noted that the publishing ecosystem uh, has been adapting incrementally to incorporate incorporate digital formats and workflows, but does not yet accommodate works that arise or grow outside of that system. Publications whose definition and growth is not contained at the outside by a publisher's list, platform requirements, or other predefined limits that help make works discoverable and sustainable. So many libraries are aspiring to or already working with this sort of multi-format, multi-audience, multi-output content. Um, and, and thinking of this idea that content is um, 
networked and modular applies beyond experimental forms of scholarship. Even a monograph could be considered a type of modular networked content. If we think of um, you know, each piece of information contained within a monograph as potentially being linked and relinked with other types of content, disaggregated and re-aggregated. Um, this is a slide from Ariana Bessereel Garcia of Redelix, uh, keynote at the Library Publishing Forum, um, uh, which inspired this idea. Um, And so finally, services. Uh, the library, publi library publishing services recognize that not all content requires traditional workflows um, and that, um, that lightweight or a la carte types of options for workflows are more suitable to a lot of the types of modern content that libraries are working with and that scholars are looking to produce. Um, So I think um, I'll, let me sum up here. Um, I think I'm all just about at time. Um, so I think we're, we're moving from a fragmented environment where libraries are working often with multiple platforms internally that may have characteristics of a publishing program or an institutional repository. The community is working with a, a wide array of softwares and and platforms that are not interoperable that are um, and that in some cases are not suiting their purpose for libraries um, uh, and it, um, initiatives like the invest in open infrastructure initiative that has recently um, come about is are attempting to bring some coordination to this space helping libraries and and other stakeholders invest smartly in technologies that are going to suit their their missions um, and I think I'll just uh, just touch on one one more of these points um, that is kind of addressing the the tension between local and global responsibilities and impacts in libraries I think library publishers have had a lot of success locally in building successful journal programs that are really serving their campus community providing alternative publishing channels for their faculty and serving a global community by producing and disseminating knowledge to scholars and citizens around the world. Um, and I think this is gonna, this is something that has, that presents as library publishers try to scale, try to become increasingly involved in a more community-wide effort to disseminate knowledge that becomes a, a tension between devoting resources to local needs and local uh, interests and this responsibility that many libraries feel to a broader uh, or kind of higher calling of, of opening knowledge more broadly. Um, and so just to conclude, I think there, there are a lot of opportunities in this space right now for a range of stakeholders to fill gaps in bringing the community together, in adding new tools and options to this ecosystem that, that work well for libraries and their collaborators um, and for library publishers as well to, to continue to produce knowledge and expand our idea of what scholarly communication can, can be. So thank you. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Maria Bon. Oh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm here to talk about um, a particular sector, I guess I would say, of the library publishing landscape, um, and one that's uh, drawing an increasing amount of attention and uh, I think uh, uh, library energy and library resources. Um, and that's about the library uh, participation in open educational resources in supporting them, developing them, and, and yes, uh, publishing them. And it's intriguing to me, I've had a kind of tripartite life as an educator, a research scholar, and a publisher, is that in our scholarly communication conversations, uh, we often neglect the fact that one of our primary venues for communicating scholarship is the classroom. We tend to think about uh, disseminating research and its results. Uh, we think about the journal publishing and the monograph publishing landscape. Uh, but one of the first places that we communicate our scholarship is to our students in the classroom. And so I think uh, that open education and 
scholarly communication uh, very much intersect. Uh, so I'm gonna begin by talking a little bit about this open educational resource thing. Um, and this is actually what I thought hardest about as I prepared my uh, points for today. Uh, as I've been out in this world the past couple of years, uh, taking my show on the road and talking about the intersection of open education and scholarly communication, uh, I found that my audiences, there's often a mix of people who are um, committed advocates to OER, and I'll re refer to open educational resources as OER th throughout, and very much steeped in the world of OER, and other people who are saying, I'm hearing about this thing, I think I should know something. Seems like people are paying attention to this. And I didn't know how my, how my um, group would fall here today. And you're a large group, so I decided not to poll you on that. Uh, so I hope I'm here not either overly simplistic or um, overly brief. Uh, but in brief, I, I think we can say that an open educational resource um, is a content uh, developed for an educational purpose, um, and that is openly shared and licensed. And I want to say a little, qualify those terms a little bit. Um, if it's openly shared and licensed, it uh, in general, when we talk about open educational resources, we don't just mean free of charge, uh, but largely free of constraints for uh, reuse um, and for development. Uh, most people in the open educational community believe that for something to be truly open, I mean, needs to be open for retention, reuse, revision, uh, remixing, and redistribution with the idea that other instructors and students will be constantly working with the material and should be sharing uh, their versions and what they've developed with the educational community as well. Uh, so beyond free of charge. And I want to say, too, that although a lot of the um, focus in the conversation is about uh, digital, uh, digital resources, and that's the way in which these have been developed and come to our attention, that doesn't necessarily preclude offline formats. Um, and in fact, many open textbooks have uh, a print version as well, um, or electronic versions that can be taken offline. Uh, so it's not necessarily only digital materials that are, that are open educational resources. Um, so with that little bit of background, uh, let's say, who cares? Who cares about open educational resources? Well, in fact, uh, quite a lot of sectors care. Um, and one area that seems to be caring quite a bit is state legislatures. Uh, they're paying a lot of attention to open education and introducing a lot of legislation uh, to support, encourage, sometimes mandate open educational, the use of open educational resources. Um, and this can be on a range from some fairly soft directives that public institutions uh, should have a marking or badging system for uh, classes that deploy open educational resources so students are aware of that when they register or making their decisions about registering. Uh, to, uh, on the other end, uh, the state of Hawaii, the legislature put forth a bill that all courses taught at state institutions must use open educational resources. Uh, that didn't actually didn't get too far. And from what I understand is that it was the open education uh, community and advocates who came forward and said no to the to the legislature, don't do this. There's no surer way to poison faculty than uh, for them to be told that they must use these. Um, and so that that uh, bill never did move forward. There's a um, online uh, newsletter that you can subscribe to called OER Digest. Comes in, I think, once a month uh, sharing updates about the open educational field. And uh, usually the top half of it is dominated by news from state legislatures. Uh, just for example, the, the one that came in the other day. It says many state legislatures are wrapping up for the year. Lots of action to report. The gover governor of Minnesota signed a bill into law asking instructors to identify, review, and approve OER use in their courses. 
Nebraska's, I'll, we'll skip the number, bill um, requiring the Educational Technology Center to evaluate digital education courses and OER was sent to the governor for signature. A Texas bill uh, calls for the development of an OER repository for the state. So uh, a lot of action at the, the level of the state legislature. And I'm just pointing here to a couple of guides that have been developed so that you can keep up with what's happening at the various, uh, in the various states. And uh, Spark is real good about providing resources to help you keep up with the action at the level of the state. Uh, another party that cares a lot about OER is funding agencies. Uh, funding agencies have become quite concerned and supportive of the development of open educational resources. Uh, the Hewlett Foundation, notably, has made large grants to support the development. Uh, but even the U.S. Department of Education um, has gotten in on the action. Um, they awarded their first uh, grant for open educational resources in September of 2018. Uh, they had uh, $5 million to dole out. Um, and they were to uh, grants to support the development of OER content that can be disseminated to the widest possible audience for the largest possible savings. Um, and the department worked with consortia uh, to look at candidates for these grants. They uh, ranged from 1.5 um, to 4.95 million. Um, and the, uh, that was the, the intention, but because they handed out multiple, that there were um, those on the smaller end. Uh, so we're, we're waiting to see if the government continues to take an interest in this area. Uh, but that was the first uh, uh, federal uh, appropriation, national appropriation uh, to, for grant funded support of open education. Who else cares about OER? Well, it won't surprise you to think that students do. Uh, students and, um, and their parents too. Uh, they realize significant savings from taking classes that use open educational resources. Uh, this was one study that indicated what they might do with that savings. Um, half of them were going to put it toward their tuition and fees. Uh, others used it to cover their personal expenses, almost half as, as well. Um, many to buy other supplies and some to cut down the amount that they had to work off of campus. Uh, there's a conference, if you're interested in this world, that you should know about that happens every October called the Open Education or Open Ed Conference. I believe it's in Phoenix, Phoenix or Tucson. It's in Arizona this, this October. Um, and this is where many sectors of the open educational world come together. Uh, when I was there last time, it was the first time I had sat at a lunch table with a um, provost from a small liberal arts college, a high school principal, two chemistry faculty members, um, and a bunch of community college students. And we just happened to land at that table um, and start, start talking OER. Uh, but at that conference, uh, they they usually bring up a group of students who have been in um, in open educational resource supported classes, uh, and they're always the hit of the conference because uh, they're so smart, they're so articulate, and it's so clear the difference that this is making in their lives to not sp not spend the money on the educational materials and to be able to um, spend it on other things like childcare and in some cases like food. Uh, so students care a lot about OER. So this is a space that libraries are stepping into. Um, and I'm wondering why we might think that uh, this is a good space for libraries and it's a productive space for them to be engaged in. I mean, I think that library, academic libraries have a, a well-established credibility in the educational space. And I started my library publishing activities in the late uh, 1990s, so I, I, I'm a veteran of the library publishing activity. Um, and I can say that there was a long period of convincing uh, scholars, our campuses, and publishers from the commercial sector that we had or could develop uh, the disciplinary expertise and the um, business capacity to be effective scholarly publishers. 
And I think when I look at the growth of the library publishing sector, I think those battles, uh, they may not have been entirely won, but we've come a long way. Uh, but in my experience in the educational space, we don't have to make those arguments as much. It's a natural area for libraries to step into. Uh, we have a long established track record of supporting education on our campuses. Um, we also have well-established partnerships and service roles with our teaching faculty. Uh, when they are looking for help with their teaching, they often turn to the library. Um, and so as they're thinking about doing something new, uh, they might say, hey, I've got an idea, or they're open to listening to librarians talking about open educational resources and how they might contribute. I think it's been a compelling space for libraries too, because there's a pretty quick turnaround to demonstrating value. Uh, not to sound uh, cynically simple, but it's for the kids. And it's, it's pretty easy to demonstrate that this is um, making a difference in the lives of students. And so it's a pretty quick re return on investment, at least at a, at a PR level, um, and sometimes in very measurable savings uh, for, for students. And because of this too, it's relatively uh, easy to enlist support. Um, so this is a, a, a natural um, and welcome space for libraries. Um, and I wanted to call your attention to the, the rise of the OER librarian. Uh, and maybe some of you are OER librarians. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, I'm an educator now. I teach academic librarianship. I track job ads closely from the academic sector. Um, and this is what I'm seeing a lot lately. Uh, open educational resources, um, or as is in the case of this job announcement I've shared here at George Mason University, the open educational resource and scholarly communication lead. Uh, so institutions are realizing that this work sits at the intersection of education and scholarly communication um, and hiring someone to look after those things. Yeah, these are just two of my favorite OER librarians, that they're real people. Um, and uh, uh, Josh there with the beard, uh, he was hired as a scholarly communication librarian. And he tells me that uh, very shortly after his arrival, um, he said, you know, we need somebody to do this open education thing too. That works for your portfolio. Uh, you, you should be looking at, at this thing too. So there are people in libraries who are specifically dedicated, some of them even have staff, uh, to uh, developing OER, to advocating for OER, and supporting the adoption of OER. And what do these people do all day? Uh, well, this is the result of a very informal poll of the ones that I know, but here's some things that came up. They manage an OER program. Um, and a lot of times there are small grants to support the development of OER on campuses, and they manage that process. Uh, they um, work with the projects. They write up uh, MOUs so everybody understands their roles. Uh, they do a lot of consulting on, licen on licensing, both for use in the open educational resource and for how to license the open ed educational resource in keeping with the goals of the campus and the faculty member. A lot of general outreach, a lot of actual creation of OER, and of course, because we all do this, committee work. Uh, but they're increasingly placed on things like textbook working groups. Um, I've seen several um, that are um, also uh, on a campus bookstore uh, committees consulting with them. Um, so they do support the development of OER. They provide platforms. They give guidance on platforms. They consult on rights. They administer grant programs. And they make a lot of connections between people. And what I want to finish by thinking about is that they also create. Uh, they publish. Uh, this is an example from uh, Kansas uh, of a textbook developed called Be Credible, Information Literacy for Journalism, Public Relations, and Advertising. Uh, this was developed by a faculty member at Kansas in consultation with the library to the extent that uh, the, one of the team members, the Open Pedagogy Librarian, is credited as a co-author because the author felt that it was so in, uh, integrally involved with the development. Uh, publishing at a large scale, uh, Open SUNY textbooks uh, started in 2012. 
And they've published, uh, I think the last count, about 40 open textbooks. Um, and uh, in 2017, the New York State Legislature awarded them $8 million to continue their work. So again, the state cares. Um, so this work is ongoing. Uh, the SUNY and the CUNY libraries working on supporting and publishing the development of open textbooks. Uh, one more example of creation. This is one I was early on the ground with. Um, open Michigan, uh, which supports all kinds of open educational resources. They have a book pro uh, program uh, developed with a bunch of faculty doctors um, in the health system. Uh, and they've published, I think, about a dozen uh, books at this point that are available online and in print, uh, openly available on everything from diabetes 101 to esophageal cancer uh, to um, reflections from children's teens and young adults with cancer and blood disorder. Um, and those docs, last I knew, when I first met with them many years ago, had big plans for feeling that like they had so much material that could be used for educational purposes that ar arose out of their their own work as doctors and out of their teaching and, and wanted to share that. So I want to say in, in conclusion that I think this is a, a very active area of educational work in general um, and particularly of library publishing work um, and that will it'll be getting quite a bit of attention in the years to come. Um, there's mounting evidence that it saves students considerably um, and that that contributes to their success. Um, a lot of uh, academic administrators are get, getting behind it and advocating for it. I think they see this as a good way of establishing their service to their, their states. Um, and faculty care. Uh, faculty who are putting a lot of work into developing materials for their courses, thinking this is a way that they can make the difference and a way that uh, their work can get more attention. Uh, because if other people adopt it and give them credit, that's how their work um, and their thinking is spread out into the world. So I look forward to your uh, questions at the end, and I think it's uh, time for John to take over. John, I think your your audio is muted. Sorry about that. Are you there? There you are. Yes, good. All right, I got the video. It was a, a good start. Um, I just wanted to start by saying to welcome everybody and to say that there will not be any PowerPoint slides, so you can resume your email and all those things you need to do towards the end of a seminar, or webinar rather. And um, what I'm going to do is take a little bit of a different stand than Sarah and Maria. I want to um, go back to the original title or the title of this uh, webinar, which is Libraries Shaping Publishing uh, in a New Era. And I wanna speak as a researcher who has partnered with libraries and collaborated with libraries and who's very interested in that kind of relationship. That is the changing role of libraries in terms of scholarly publishing. Um, as a uh, education professor, I was very interested in changing access to knowledge and research. Um, in the 90s, and I found really my first source of support on campus from libraries. Uh, Martha Whitehead at the University of British Columbia invited me to give talks, and I began to collaborate with libraries. Um, and so since then, I've developed a public, what's called the Public Knowledge Project. Um, Sarah presented, uh, we were part of that picture of open source software. We develop open journal systems, and that system, um, is being used by around 9,000 journals around the world as an open source publishing platform. And that was made possible by a partnership with Simon Fraser University Library in 2005. And we've continued to work together around that. And the shaping of publishing in terms of this cooperation or partnership with libraries um, involves a number of different elements that I'll briefly describe. And then I wanna shift to another aspect of how libraries are shaping um, publishing. But first, in terms of my own experience as a researcher working with libraries, um, we at, that partnership takes a variety of different forms. We have committees in which libraries advise us about the shaping of our uh, software, about the uh, 
workflow, the way in which we distribute the materials, the way in which it gets uh, indexed um, and distributed, and the publishing platform, which goes through the traditional publishing steps of submission and review and production, uh, is something that the librarians have um, helped us in terms of understanding how they can help others um, and support uh, a publishing platform like this. So part of the story around OJS um, has been that libraries have become hosts of uh, open journal systems um, and have been able to offer to their faculty and students an opportunity to operate a journal, a peer reviewed journal on a platform. And in fact, one interesting idea I think I want to share with you around this concept um, is that what does it mean to be a publisher? Uh, it occurs to me that the libraries are acting as publishers in some instances, instances, and in other cases are really involved in hosting a platform. I mean, part of the digital era is that we are in an age of platforms um, and what people do with those platforms um, is very important. And many of them are in the case of OJS, I mean, most of them, I should say, are operating peer reviewed journals um, with the support of libraries, that libraries are partnering and hosting the platform, um, but the group of scholars or the scholarly society or the group of students are engaged in the publishing of the journal. And I think it's a, an important distinction, and I think the libraries are reshaping a scholarly publishing by providing that ability um, and the imprint, uh, imprimatur of the, of the university uh, in terms of enabling scholars to take back control of publishing in some cases, innovate with new journals, um, advance academic freedoms in terms of the ability to create journals around new areas. So the libraries are playing a, a different role in scholarly communication and one that is marked in particular by this ability um, to share open source software and to provide uh, platforms that enable this kind of publishing. Uh, in our case, we are engaged in a two-way relationship. That is, the librarians are working uh, with us um, in the Public Knowledge Project, and we're working with librarians. We've been doing work with the Lib Library Publishing Coalition, um, and in, in that regard, in particular, around education and, and uh, professional development. So PKP School has courses on editing and on reviewing, um, and we're looking for ways in which we can educate around uh, publishing um, for faculty members that are new to this, for those who want to begin to start their own journals, um, but to gain a general appreciation for publishing more broadly. And it's not just about the journals that we operate, um, but the idea of professional standards more uh, broadly. So the second part of I'd like to introduce is this idea of how uh, libraries are shaping publishing um, in the new era, as the uh, title of the webinar puts it. Um, and that's around the, a more cooperative approach to publishing, that libraries are beginning to become involved in, in particular, an example I want to use is a, a subscribe to open model of open access. The whole initiative behind my project, the Public Knowledge Project, was an advocacy of open access. The library's initiatives in publishing have been focused uh, largely on open access. But in terms of working with conventional publishers, if I can use that term, um, there is a, an approach now towards moving away from a vendor relationship with libraries um, among vendors, or uh, good point, uh, among publishers, and looking more and more to ways of cooperating and partnering um, with libraries, much as we've done in the Public Knowledge Project. In this example that I'm using of, of the uh, subscribe to open model, uh, something that Annual Reviews has been doing is one an example of a, a publisher, a nonprofit one, but certainly uh, a, a traditional publisher in many ways, is to have the libraries support open access um, by paying similar fees to what they would for subscribing to conventional closed access journals. And this idea that the libraries would begin to participate as a partner rather than simply as a consumer um, buying from a vendor um, to me is a, is a radical change in terms of how libraries are shaping publishing. As publishers respond to this opportunity to cooperate in terms of the development of software in my case and platforms, um, but this idea of subscribing or partnering around open um, is, a, is a, a radical change in one level and in another level, it seems to me to go back to the tradition of libraries as being centers and communities um, for sharing and for a knowledge commons. 
um, that has been based on cooperation and collective action. So I'm very conscious of leaving some time for questions in this one hour webinar. Um, and I would thank you and I wanna turn it back to Jason at this point. I think. Right. Yep, thank you very much, John. And uh, thank you to Sarah and Maria as well. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. Uh, I'll start out with one here for, uh, for Sarah. Uh, Sarah, can you speak to what, if any, work is being done to integrate library published content with archives such as clocks and portico? Uh, there seems to be just as much, if not greater, risk for the long-term preservation of library-hosted content as with other content. Uh, do you want to speak to that, please? Sure. I, I think this is a, it's a really great point and it's something that libraries are uh, definitely thinking about. Um, it's, it's something that's extremely important to libraries in their roles as content stewards and thinking of content as a long-term commitment, that the content they're creating is something that they plan to, um, to, to steward for the long-term. Um, however, the um, the surveys of the library publishing community, including the library publishing directory, which is a, an annual publication of the, the library publishing coalition have found that most libraries aren't actively uh, using clocks or portico or other digital preservation services actively. Um, and that they tend to, you know, have, uh, to be following good practices for, you know, for backups and, and archiving, but not true digital preservation activities. So I think this is a, um, an area that, that warrants, um, more attention. I don't know if, uh, if, if John or Maria has other thoughts on, on that. Uh, <laughs> and I would just add that, um, the, the CLOCKS initiative and, and that whole sense of responsibility for the preservation of, of journals is a very important aspect. Um, and if anything, you would argue that the libraries have always been uh, working in the area of archiving and protecting of resources. Um, I think JSTOR is another example that might be considered as well in terms of the longer term preservation aspects, but I guess porticos associated with it. So. I would just affirm that we have worked with libraries and the journals that uh, use our platform are connected to a version of LOCKS as well. And I'll, I'll just chime in as uh, you know, someone who comes from a background in commercial publishing, uh, you know, where the commercial publishers, it's long been the expectation, the, the, the you know, quite rightly requirement that uh, they make that, uh, you know, that, that commitment that as uh, universities and institutional libraries become the primary repository that, uh, that they'll have to uh, go ahead and make sure that they preserve uh, content as well. So thank you. Uh, next question, uh, this one is for Maria. Um, Maria, how much of the OER projects you've seen have been more well, one and done where a grant funds the content and it doesn't change versus projects designed from the start to be ongoing, updated, evolved content with students, faculty, and others contributing and updating? Well, I, I think it, I can think of two ways of thinking about that question. In order to be almost by definition an open educational resource, it needs to be licensed so that it can be remixed and redistributed. So I think many are um, created with the expectation that um, if it's not the original author that's doing the revision, um, it might be the next instructor that picks it up. Uh, maybe it's their students. Uh, that, and that depends on the pedagogical use of, of the material. Uh, so there's a kind of expectation built in that it will be a living document. Uh, and in other cases, and I can't give you any numbers around this, but I am aware of people that um, are creating them with the expectation that they will be revising them as they go along for their own courses. Uh, and yes, the, the grant funding was a nice way to support the development and to expand on something they may have already had underway. Uh, but their assumption is that 
uh, the course content will be updated and the resource will be updated along along with that. Uh, but as with any uh, you know good old fashioned print textbook, it might float around for a real long time. Uh, like, huh? Okay, it's still a sixty eight edition. Doesn't matter. Oh, it's calculus. Has calculus changed much? Uh, so I think uh, it, it very much depends on the subject, uh, the nature of the resource. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this question is really for uh, for any of our three panelists. Um, uh, libraries' reliance on open source software requires significant local expertise that uh, some library budgets and talent pools can't sustain. Wouldn't it be better to have fewer dominant systems that are highly developed and need less local implementation? I mean, it's a good one for me maybe to jump in as someone who develops open source software um, and deals with these kinds of issues. There are two things that distinguish our approach. One is that we don't assume uh, great local expertise in the sense that we try to provide a very supportive uh, approach to the development of open source software. It's one thing to put a license on the software that makes it open, um, whether that's a GPL or a Berkeley license. It's another to provide the kind of support around help, around installation, and around, uh, we use a community forum as well. Um, but the second aspect is that we provide publishing services, that there are those who don't have the expertise or don't aren't interested um, in hosting and managing open source software. Uh, and so part of our responsibility and response has been to provide a publishing services uh, sister unit that hosts, uh, does customization and provides that kind of um, technical support. So we're, we are part of a diverse number of uh, software systems. Um, Sarah mentioned uh, Coco a little while ago. There are other open source software to provide a, a, a series of choices of tools. Um, and I don't think anyone needs to feel that they have to have that development locally in every instance. Um, but part of our thinking, too, is to develop that local expertise um, is an important aspect, whether it's among students or staff. Um, the opportunities are there. OK, good, good. Um, and, and if we have time, I've got a follow up question on that for you. Uh, but uh, another question from our attendees, uh, Maria. Are there any tips around stakeholder support for initiating OER work? What's worked well in your experience in getting provosts or other university administration on board? Well, if you're asking at the administrative level, I think being aware of the research, the evidence, um, the mounting body of policy at the state level uh, that is advocating for, for OER and demonstrating its efficacy for students um, and preparing briefs on that, uh, that this is something where we can see a pretty um, significant and quick return for a relatively uh, low amount of investment. Uh, in terms of uh, finding adopters among the faculty to use or to create OER. That's, that's another set of skills and relationships that have to be built. Uh, for the faculty, I think, who, to deploy them in their classroom, the most significant barrier has been location. Uh, just, okay, what can I use my class? Um, is it good? And that's an area where there are librarians who are stepping in to help identify. So, uh, here's, here's a number of materials. This, these could be useful. Uh, for uh, faculty who might want to create uh, open educational resources, I think librarians need to be able to talk to them about how it fits into their overall scholarly goals and how they prioritize their time as instructors and researchers. Uh, somebody wants to change the question up a little bit. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Maria. Um, I've got one question, uh, and this again is a follow-up question, uh, mostly for John, but uh, Maria and Sarah as well. I'd like your opinions. Um, and this goes back to uh, the, the previous question about uh, having fewer dominant systems versus local implementation. And uh, you know, this is something I've pondered as well. That if uh, you know, we start relying on this network of of institutions all providing their own open repositories. Uh, you know, what is that going to do for 
the discovery and dissemination of content versus uh, a, a, a an ecosystem where there are fewer dominant systems, such as uh, Hopkins Project Muse, for instance, or even the commercially uh, the, the commercial publishers' systems like the Wiley Online Library. Um, you know, if you guys could discuss the pros and cons of uh, the, the approach, I'd appreciate that. Well, Sarah, I'll give you a chance to open on this one if you'd like. Sure, I have a few thoughts on that. Um, I, discovery has been a challenge uh, for as long as, as I've been involved with the library publishing community and, and before this question of, and again, it, it extends beyond library publishers to all types of open access content. Um, that doesn't necessarily tr travel in the same through the same channels of of um, of dissemination to library and other um, other traditional content curators. Um, and I think in some ways it's true that having a diversity of different platforms makes it more difficult could can make it more difficult to curate that content and disseminate it. On the other hand, if we have, robust new publishing infrastructure that is built on open standards that is using that is that is truly um, using the principles of linked data uh, and and the uh, you know leveraging the possibilities of networked information there are so many opportunities to for harvesting metadata from repositories um, and aggregating it in ways that are actually potentially much more useful to researchers, are much more comprehensive, um, much more robust in terms of how you can analyze and, and discover and what kinds of discovery tools and layers you can build to, to use on top of that, that content. Um, and you know, a lot of the, the newer softwares out there are being designed with, with this in mind, um, with the idea that not only does the that the software needs to be interoperable based on open standards, that the content within it also needs to be as um, needs to have robust metadata that allows it that can be harvested um, on a broad scale. Um, and so I think uh, I so I don't think that it's a, a a question of you know we just need one mega platform that can have all of the stuff in it and then we can search it and that, you know, that's the solution. I think there's actually a lot more possibilities afforded when uh, we're all just, when we can commit to using um, open standards. Here, here. Well, well put. And, uh, you know, I think a, a good enough answer that, uh, that, that John gives you uh, support rather than adding anything else. Um, with that, uh, we don't have any other questions from the audience, uh, so I will give just a, a minute or two if anybody uh, in the audience does want to throw something in last minute. Otherwise, uh, thank you everybody for attending and thank you to uh, Sarah, Maria, and John for your excellent presentations today. And uh, to the Charleston Conference, uh, thank you on behalf of the SSP for uh, you know, participating in this, this collaboration. Uh, we hope it's the first of many between our organizations and this audience. That's right. And thank you, Jason, for moderating. Um, it was a fantastic session. I really uh, learned a lot. Um, just briefly, I want to draw your attention to some upcoming events for both the Charleston Conference and uh, SSP. Um, and just again, echo the thanks that Jason gave to all of you for presenting and participating today. And thanks to our audience for being here and asking good questions. Um, and hope to see you again in our next collaborative webinar. Um, thanks a lot. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>